Wow. Never underestimate how some time away from filming will make me feel so much more awkward in front of the camera. <laughs> it's taken me so long to make this video, but brand new baby. That's my bath, right? That's my, that's the card I'm gonna play for this. So if it seems really rushed, it's because it is. And um, yeah, but here's my birth story. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It has been three, four long months. I am really excited today to chat with you and share my birth story. My daughter, my baby girl, Briar Ophelina Deal, was born on May 13th, 2021 on a Thursday morning at 2.34 a.m. She was seven pounds, 4.2 ounces, and 20 and a half inches long. And this is the story of how she came into the world. So I'm sure everyone who has watched my channel and anyone who follows me on Facebook or Instagram knows that I had gestational diabetes. Before that, and not considering that, my plan was to just go into labor on my own naturally and I wanted to do everything in my power to make that happen, which I now realize is nothing. <laughs> There's nothing you can do if you're trying to put yourself into labor, your body just goes into labor when it's ready to do so and when baby's ready to do so. I was trying everything. I was trying evening primrose oil. We were walking all over the place. Once I hit 40 weeks, I would get up every morning and curb walk all the way around my neighborhood. I'm sure if there were any people in our cul-de-sac who didn't have children, they were like, what is this crazy lady doing every morning? <laughs> With her giant pregnant belly walking in circles doing curb walks around the, around the cul-de-sac. But I was doing everything that I thought was in my power. I was eating date bars, like three or four date bars a day. I mean, just everything that you could read about, we were trying to make me go into labor and it just wasn't happening. I would have liked to continue if all of the circumstances had been perfect, but you know, with having gestational diabetes, and with knowing the statistics of the further I wait, the higher my risk being of having a C-section, I was just getting to the point where I knew we were going to have to do something. There is nothing wrong with cesarean section. I just did not want one. Personally, that scares me a lot. And if you've had a C-section, you go mama, but ooh, that scared me to death and I was trying to avoid it if possible. I was not like, I'm sick of being pregnant. I don't wanna be pregnant anymore. I loved being pregnant. I just was wanting to meet this little person and find out who they were and hold them in my arms. I just knew that the further we went, the longer we waited, the more serious things could get at the end. And we didn't know if she was big or little. Obviously at the time we didn't know it was a girl, but we didn't know if baby was big or little because those ultrasounds at the end are kind of like 50-50 chance of being correct. You know, this baby could be measuring kind of small, but this baby can end up being big. We really were just like too scared to roll the dice, basically. I went in for my appointment on Tuesday, which was 41 weeks and a day. I had an 11 o'clock appointment and I went in there thinking, okay, we can't really wait any longer. I could either have her strip my membranes or we could talk about some other options because what we were trying wasn't working. So we go into our appointment, we discuss our options and I come around to the decision to accept trying the Foley balloon. Before I got the balloon put in, my midwife called the hospital. She was like, I don't want to induce you if they don't have a room for you at the hospital. So she goes, she calls the hospital. She comes back into our room and she says, it's going to be a busy week for scheduled inductions at the hospital. So if we do the Foley balloon today, I'd like for you to go home and get your stuff and go to the hospital and claim your room. Um, what? <laughs> I was expecting 
to mostly labor at home. I was wanting to labor at home and then when I got to a certain place with my contractions, then go into the hospital. That's just what I was expecting, that was my plan. Now I understand that things go different and I knew that my plan was gonna have to change going into birth because I knew everything wasn't gonna just fall into place and go exactly according to my birth plan because birth is unpredictable. I was kind of thinking I was like, I was gonna have all this time to labor at home. I mean, everyone, everyone was like, oh, your first baby, you'll be in labor for hours or days. Like, you know, don't expect to just run into the hospital and everything happens. So when she said, go home, pack your stuff up and go to the hospital, I was like, we need a minute to talk about this. And so Brian and I talked it over and eventually we came to the conclusion that maybe this is what was gonna be best for now. I got the Foley balloon, I was two centimeters, and I didn't really want cervical checks like throughout, I didn't have any throughout pregnancy, and I didn't really want them throughout labor and birth, but, you know, when she was putting in the Foley balloon, she just naturally was able to feel what was going on. If, if you're possibly going to be induced, I will tell you, it was a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of pressure. I don't know that I would say it hurt but it was a lot of pressure. So I get the balloon inserted and uh, I had the double balloon. So basically they put one on one side of your, I think one on one side of your cervix and one on the other side and they fill them up with fluid and little by little it's supposed to like help you dilate. And then hopefully you dilate enough that it falls out. We'll talk about that later. That was not my experience, but that's the hope when you insert the balloon. Sorry if that's too graphic, but that's just part of birth. We go to get some lunch, we go home, we pack everything up, we text our neighbors, hey, can you check in on Einstein? I'm going to the hospital to be induced. And we head to the hospital. We get to the hospital around 3 p.m., we get checked in. Honestly, looking back, I'm so thankful we did because we got checked in, we were able to rest, we played some card games, we watched some TV, and we got lots of sleep. We ate. I read a lot of people commenting that like the food wasn't very good at the hospital where we delivered. You know, they gave us like a spreadsheet and we're like, pick everything you want to eat and we'll bring it to you. And that was kind of awesome. And we thought the food was pretty okay. We weren't having to worry about like cooking or anything like that and we were being monitored. We did wear a mask the whole time that we were in the hospital. Brian had his mask on almost the whole time and I did not wear my mask during labor, but I did try to have it on every other time. Once my test came back that I was negative, they were a little more loosey-goosey about it, but we weren't able to have our doula there and I didn't actually find that out until after because she didn't want to freak me out. They did decide that they should just go back to one support person in the room and so our doula was not able to be in the room with us, but that's kind of all that COVID affected, I guess. Some people get the Foley balloon, they go home and they just let stuff happen, but we wanted to make sure we had a room when I like went into labor. The balloon is in for 12 hours. So around midnight, they came into the room and what basically what they do, I don't know if this is like what they do across the board, but what they did for me was they like tug on it and see if they can just pull it out, if you're dilated enough that they can pull it out. And they weren't able to do that. And so then what they did was they basically like deflate the balloon so they take the liquid out of the balloons and then they take it out. The Foley balloon had only moved me one centimeter which initially I was kind of disappointed but then I remembered like oh yeah I wasn't even gonna have cervical checks at all and birth moves really fast and just because I only moved a centimeter in 12 hours it doesn't really mean anything honestly. So I was a little bit disappointed but then I was like yeah whatever it's not that big of a deal. So what they decided to do then to keep things progressing was to start me on a 24 hour protocol of misoprostol and I was a little nervous about that but I just am not I don't really like to take medicine if I don't have to but again I'm trying to avoid um, any other sort of interventions I really did not want to be put on Pitocin again no shame no judgment if that was someone else's choice but that just wasn't my choice for my birth and wasn't something that I wanted so I was trying to avoid Pitocin my midwife said okay we're gonna do this 24 hour protocol for misoprostol and if that doesn't get stuff going we might have to look into our options as far as like what else we could do and that would probably mean pitocin so i was really hoping and praying that misoprostol is going to get stuff moving and get stuff happening so at midnight they came in they took the balloon out and 
we decided we wanted to get some rest. So we rested until about 6 a.m. They came in and we started my misoprostol. So basically what they do is, well, what they did for me, again, this may not be what they do everywhere. I know there are like suppository options, but what they did for me was kind of like dilute the pill in water. So they would bring them to me in this like syringe that looked like it was just filled with water. And they would give me the syringe that had the medicine in it and the water and I would just like basically drink it from the syringe. And the nurses warned me that it had like a funny taste but that it wasn't like gross or anything, it just had a weird taste. Totally agree with that. It tasted like plastic water bottle. <laughs> it tasted like you melted down a plastic water bottle and drank it. I mean, I don't actually know what that tasted like but if I had to imagine that's what it was. It just tastes like weird plastic. I was being monitored intermittently. They were not monitoring me constantly. It was just like a little intermittent monitoring to make sure that the misoprostol wasn't getting the baby's heart rate way up. So we wait a little bit and we eat breakfast and the second dose of misoprostol I took around 7.45. What we continued to do over the next several hours was monitoring and taking miso about every hour until 11.30 and then we started every two hours. Because we had so much downtime in the hospital, like I said, we got a lot of rest, we took a lot of naps, we played a lot of games, watched a lot of TV. We also spent a lot of time FaceTiming with family. So I was on the phone with my mom probably a total of four or five hours throughout the day because I just wanted to talk to her and she told me to call her like just throughout things that were going on. I'm noticing there's a weird shadow on my face. <laughs> So she told me just to call her and chat with her just to like make time go by quicker. So I did that. I talked to her quite a bit throughout the process. I talked to my sister a little bit. We walked up and down the halls of the hospital and up and down the stairs. So around like 2.30 p.m. I took a little nap. We went downstairs to the little coffee shop in the hospital and grab some coffee. And again, that involved like walking up and down the stairs, walking up and down the hallways. So at that point, I come back to the room, I get back on the monitor, and on the monitor we could see that I was having contractions. But I really couldn't quite feel them. I was bouncing on the ball, on the, um, the exercise ball, the birth ball, bouncing on that. I was like playing on the computer. I was doing all sorts of things. So I was doing all the stuff that was distracting me so I wasn't able to really feel the contractions. But they were on the monitor, we could tell that that's what was going on. So then my midwife came in and she wanted to check me again and I consented to that because I was kind of curious how things were moving and what was going on. So she checked me again, I was four centimeters dilated so that was like almost another 12 hours and I had only moved one centimeter. Again, at first I was really frustrated and then I was like, you know what, this doesn't really mean anything. Stuff happens quick, don't let it get to you. I was four centimeters dilated, 70% of face, and I was at, uh, position wise, I was like at a negative one to zero. If you're like an L&D nurse or if you're a midwife or a doula or if you're close to giving birth, you'll probably know what that means. I don't dare explain it because I know I won't get it right. But that's just like the positioning, I think, of where the baby's head is. But that's kind of all I can give you. My midwife also said, and this is a direct quote, that I had a bulging bag of waters, which was apparently a good thing that it's bulging because it meant that a uh, baby had their head putting a lot of pressure on that bag of water, which meant that it could break at any moment. So that was good. That was hopeful news and we were excited thinking that things might get moving really soon. And that was at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, May 12th. A lot of this I'm reading from notes that Brian took while we were in the hospital. Actually, I'm gonna read it to you. It says, progressing well. We'll probably be able to sleep tonight and move into active labor late tonight or early tomorrow morning. Christina, that's my midwife, will come and check in tomorrow unless we progress more tonight. If waters don't break naturally, we may look into having to break them tomorrow. <laughs> well, you heard me say what time Briar was born. Around, I, I'm thinking it was around eight or nine. I had eaten dinner a little bit. I wasn't super hungry and I was bouncing on the ball and then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try to rest. When I lay down and I'm not like bouncing on the ball or watching TV or playing on my phone, I'm just laying in the bed, I'm like, oh, I think I'm feeling contraction. So I decide, and I don't really know what time this is, I'm gonna get in the shower. 
because sometimes that can make your contractions feel a little better. I had like a waterproof speaker on the wall of the shower. I've got my music playing. I'm singing along to my music. I'm swaying my hips with contractions. I'm in a great mood. I'm talking to everyone. And I think I was in the shower for about an hour. In the process of me being in the shower, things took a turn. Things start to progress rapidly. I was squatting at one point and my sweet, sweet nurse Heather came in and she asked if she could do a cervical check and I was like, basically, if you can do that in the position I'm in now, feel free, but I cannot move. I have to do what I'm doing right now. My body just really took over. There was another point where Brian was in there talking to me and helping me through things and I said, I need you to take the music and turn the music off. I need you to leave and I need you to turn the lights off. <laughs> and I just needed to kind of like mama bear, get in my cave and have some dark and some quiet. And um, of course I'm vocalizing and I'm trying to remember all the things we learned in birth class. Sweet, sweet Brian did all these birth classes with me to help me through labor and turns out he didn't get to use any of it because <laughs> I just did my thing and needed some time alone. By the time I get out of the shower, my water has broken. I'm not in my beautiful labor gown that I bought. I am in the shorts, <laughs> the pregnancy workout shorts that I bought and a little camisole top. I've dried myself off. I've like rinsed my clothes out in between contractions to hang up so that I can wear them later because I didn't pack a ton of clothes for the hospital. I'm kind of getting shaky talking about this. My spontaneous rupture of membranes or basically when my water broke was Wednesday the 12th at 11 p.m. That wasn't like right on the dot but that was when I was like I think my water broke. So then that's the onset of labor basically is my water broke 11 p.m. Pretty sure I was still in the shower at that point. When I decide I can't be in the shower anymore, I get out and I look at my labor nurse and I say, call the midwife, call the midwife, I need her, I need her now, I need Christina. And at that point, <laughs> I got onto the toilet backwards and I was like, oh, I have to push, I have to push right now. <laughs> I really need to push and if you've been in labor you probably know that that's not something you can fight that's not something you can hold back that is like your body is telling you what to do and gosh you better do what it says my labor nurse is like um I can deliver your baby if I have to but I really want you to wait until the, the midwife is here I know it's hard just hang in there and I'm like okay okay <laughs> I'm trying so hard to hold back but oh my gosh, it was the most primal feeling I've ever felt. It was my body knew what it had to do and it had to do it now. And honestly, I, and of course this is just my like hypothesis, but I think if, if I did not have to like stall myself, I may have given birth a lot sooner, but I really did want to wait for my midwife to get there. So I was kind of holding back. Christina, my midwife, walks in at the perfect time. About the time she walked in, I had somehow, I don't even know how, it's all a blur. I'd somehow gotten to the hospital bed and I had it tilted almost straight up and I had my elbows on the top of it. The hospital bed and my body were like parallel to each other and I had my arms on top. And I was like, oh, trying not to push, trying not to push. And finally, Brian is like, can, can we get another doctor in here? Like, could we get someone in here to help? Because she can't hold back anymore. And about that time, Christina walked in. I swear she had a halo around her head. I was like, I'm so glad you're here. I think I like started crying a little bit or maybe even more than I was already crying. And I started pushing at like 12 minutes after midnight. I pushed for around two and a half hours. I was moving in all sorts of different positions. Again, I think I think stalling myself when I felt the need to push. And then also I think once I saw Christina and I knew she was there, I think I kind of let my guard down a little bit and I think I got a little lazy. I think at one point I screamed, how big is this kid's head? <laughs> Thank heavens I had my midwife there. Brian was an awesome coach. My labor nurses were incredible. I used the bar, like the pushing bar, and I kind of used it like kind of right here. I was hanging over it. I pushed my arms and my feet and like pulled up with it. That was really helpful because I was 
pulling and pulling my chin to my chest like every muscle <laughs> after I was done. Every muscle right here was so tense and hurt so bad. It was so sore. Briar was born at 2.34 a.m. They brought her up to my chest and they hadn't even cut the umbilical cord yet. And I was holding her and looking at her and I was like, oh my gosh, you're here, you're here. And then what felt like five minutes had passed, but it maybe wasn't even that long. And I was like, wait, wait, what? Is this a boy or a girl? Is it a boy or a girl? And Brian looked and wasn't able to see because the umbilical cord was between Briar's legs. And so he looked and he was like, ah, ah, ah. and the nurse behind him said, it's a girl. And he was like, it's a girl. And I was like, it's a girl. <laughs> And I look at her and I was like, oh, it's Briar. She's Briar, which was Brian's name that he had picked out that he really liked. I think I told you guys in a video that I had a girl name and he had a girl name. And we like every day, one name, like we were like, gonna go with mine, gonna go with his, gonna go with mine, gonna go with his. And I said, I'll just decide when I see her. And as soon as I saw her, I was like, that's Briar. That's Briar. The story of her name will be for another video because this is about birth. <laughs> I plan to make a video talking about her name, which will be a short one. It's not a super long conversation. And I'd like to make a video about our breastfeeding journey. So if that's something that you guys are interested in, drop a comment and let me know and we'll we'll see. I'll, I can chat about that as well. After Briar was born, not everyone feels this and that's totally fine. But I did feel that like immediate connection, that immediate rush of uh, oxytocin, like this is my baby, I've waited for her forever and here she is and she's so beautiful and oh my gosh. And so if, again, if you've given birth, you know that like um, you're holding your baby and you're having all these amazing things, but then there's like other stuff they're taking care of while, <laughs> while you're in baby bliss holding your newborn. So. We waited until the cord got white and stopped pulsing and Brian was able to cut the cord. I delivered my placenta and then they noticed that I was bleeding a lot and I was having trouble stopping bleeding. I wasn't, basically the way my midwife explained it was that I wasn't having like a full hemorrhage, but it was like almost what they consider having a hemorrhage. So at that point, and I had already talked with my midwife about this, I decided that a shot of Pitocin would be the way to go to help my body contract and stop bleeding. So I did get a shot of Pitocin in my arm. I did have to have some stitching. I didn't have any issues on the outside, but I had some small stitching that I had to have on the inside. I really only felt the like numbing. I didn't really feel anything else. Of course they came in periodically to do checks on my belly to make sure that my uterus was shrinking back down and everything seemed to be going okay there. That's pretty much it. We stayed in the hospital that Thursday night and that Friday night. I did not want to stay Friday night, but due to some issues we were having and just wanting to have extra monitoring for Briar, we decided that maybe we would stick around for another night. It was just another night we didn't have to cook dinner and another night we didn't have to do laundry and another night we had some extra help. So we decided to to do that. Briar was awesome in the hospital. Her first couple of days with us were just absolutely incredible. Around 8 a.m. she and I decided to get some sleep and so we got her to sleep in her bassinet and I slept in the hospital bed. She slept really well in the hospital. You know that first night they sleep really well because they're so tired from coming into the world and being born. Her little feet prints are perfect. The, the nurse that did them said I don't think I've ever had them come out this perfectly. Her little footprints. She was doing the sweet little like stretching and making little squeaky noises. And her favorite position was like what we were calling the flying squirrel, like her arms and legs totally out. She's just, she's still is awesome, but she was just an awesome little baby. Our night nurse, the nurse that was with us like during birth, before she left for her shift for the day, she came in and gave us a little hospital hat that had a big bow on the front. Cause I had talked with her before giving birth. I told her like, we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl, but if it was a girl, I'd be ordering bows from the hospital bed. Like she has to have hair bows, which is true. I did order bows for her from the hospital bed. <laughs> The day Briar was born, the high was 62 degrees Fahrenheit. The low was 40 degrees Fahrenheit. We had a little window that we couldn't see like out into Fairbanks, but we could see like 
outside. It was basically like you could see across this like courtyard that you couldn't actually get out to and then another hallway but we could see out there so we had some, some natural light coming in but we couldn't see like trees or anything which was kind of a bummer but it was nice to have a window and the day that she was born was really sunny with fluffy clouds in the sky actually the day she was born there was really high aurora activity her hair in the hospital was brown but it had like a little red tint when you would get it in the natural lighting when they put her on my chest and i looked at her i immediately was like brian she looks just like you and i still think she's brian's little twin some people say she looks like me i don't know there are some baby pictures where i can kind of see it like maybe she's a more tan version of me but i think she looks just like brian and i love that she was born in room 217 at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. My midwife was Christina Amundsen and I had several nurses throughout the time I was there. When I first got checked in, it was Rachel. I had a daytime Heather and a nighttime Heather and they were both amazing. I actually requested to um, have nighttime Heather come back and she actually was there with me through most of my labor, which was awesome. And she's the one that brought Briar the little hat with a bow in it. And then we also had a nurse named Lindsay and a nurse named Latanya, who I absolutely loved. She was so awesome. She started out as, well, I think full time she works as a NICU nurse, but they pulled her in to help with Briar. And then even though Briar wasn't ever in the NICU, she was just helping, like she was like her nurse. And then the next night, they brought her in and they were like, we just wanted to introduce to you your night nurse. And I was like, hey, Latanya, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> so we kind of built a little rapport with her. We actually got some pictures with her before we left the hospital because she was just so great to us and so kind to us and helpful. And we just, we really loved her. I, I told her, I was like, I wish you would just come home with us and be our nurse at home. <laughs> and she was like, my kids might be a little upset, but Briar's so cute. I really want to. Like I said, our doula Jean was not able to be with us, but I absolutely loved her. If things change with COVID and you're in the Fairbanks area, highly recommend Jean as a doula. She's wonderful. She stopped by with an orchid. And then when she came to visit us at home, she actually brought our favorite milkshakes from the diner nearby. So sweet. I couldn't have them the last half of my pregnancy because of gestational diabetes. Briar was a teeny tiny bit jaundiced. I'll talk more about that as I talk about her breastfeeding story because that did affect that a little bit, but otherwise she was super healthy, a super happy baby, and I had a wonderful birth experience at Fairbanks Memorial and totally would recommend it to anyone. Just amazing nurses, amazing care, and we were super happy. I'm glad that things played out the way that they did. When I filmed this, I forgot to mention that the day we brought her home from the hospital, there was a rainbow in the sky. This is special because she's our little rainbow baby, but also because when I was brought home from the hospital, there was a rainbow in the sky that day as well. Thank you so much for hanging in here and watching my birth story. I just appreciate you watching it and being along for this journey with us and we are loving being Briar's parents. If you would like to, please subscribe to our channel and hopefully we'll have more videos coming out soon. I would also love for you to give my video a thumbs up. You can share it with a friend who might be delivering their baby soon. Babies are not pizzas, they're not delivered, they are born. <laughs> if you have a friend that is going into labor soon, then feel free to share this video with them and I would love for you to leave me a comment. See you next time, bye.